gracious Heavenly Father, I just want to give you thanks for all of the trials, the afflictions, the tribulations that you bring into our life to give you, give us the opportunity to give you glory, honor, and praise that we may grow in grace and knowledge of you, that our faith being much more precious than gold be tried and tested and found worthy of, of your praise. We uh, stand in your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we come before you boldly, the throne of grace in the Holy Spirit, asking you to seal to our hearts that which is truth and only truth, filtering out all of the foolishness and the error, but sealing to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray these things. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Uh, com, and we are continuing on in our study in 1 Thessalonians, and we've arrived at chapter 3. In our last study, we had finished chapter 2. We have the Holy Spirit declaring that we are the joy and the, glo the glory of our God and Father. What a marvelous thought that is. Are we to believe as we continue here in chapter 3 that we're only looking at the longing of the heart of Paul or, or the feelings of Paul or that the feelings that uh, Paul has for the believers at the, the church there in Thessalonica is that what we're supposed to believe I've emphasized uh, on numerous occasions through numerous studies how important it is that we understand that this is God's Word not the logic, the reasoning of Paul. In chapter 2, we read that the Holy Spirit declares that they had received from Paul the Word of God. That's what they received from Paul. Not Paul's Word, but the Word of God. That which he spoke was God's Word. This is God's Word. Not Paul's Word. Chapter 2 ended with them being their joy and glory. Therefore, we are the Father's joy and glory. I can't help but see that in the text. And there are no chapter divisions in the original manuscripts. So I read verse 1 of chapter 3 as saying, Wherefore, because you are our joy and our glory, when we could no longer forbear, when we could no longer put up with, with it, we thought it would be good to be left at Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. Now, is that the heart of Paul? Well, I have no doubt that it is. Was it Paul's idea to write this? I have no doubt that it was not. It was our loving Heavenly Father that had Paul pen these words. The suffering and the difficulties in the life of Paul are simply a wonderful testimony to us of, of just how much love, how much energy God has put into our redemption because of these words. And because we are prone to look only at Paul, we lose sight of the fact that our loving Heavenly Father has redeemed us at great price. We can say that Paul and, and the apostles are paying a great price. I don't know how many times over the years, folks, that I've heard people talk about the Bible as if, well, it can't be trusted because it was just written by individuals a group of individuals that often contradicted one another and, and so on and so forth. They don't see it as the Word of God. My question to all of you is, is how much as you study through God's Word do you see this? Do you interpret these verses as, as what they are? As what it is? The Word of God. You know, when Paul had his experience on the road to Damascus and he had his eyes open to the fact that God had always had him in view had chosen him from his mother's womb, 
You suppose he was encouraged when, when God said, I will show him what great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Is it unreasonable that God's messengers would suffer? Do you suppose God suffered in our redemption? Are we able to somehow in, in, our, in our human frame of mind to even begin to understand what it was like to be God who created the heavens and the earth, who said, let there be light, who hung the stars in the sky, who said, let there be light, and there was light. To become our kinsman redeemer. To have the wonderful truth of His Word that our sins are forgiven, our iniquities and our trespasses are forgiven, that they will be remembered no more, they're buried in the deepest sea, cast behind His back, sought for and not found, that the Almighty, eternal God determined to show His wrath against sin, yet that wrath was poured out for us on Christ. God Almighty, who left the glory of heaven, He left the adulation of the angels, and be, become, became our, our kinsman to walk on this earth in the midst of filthy creatures that, that he, whom He could have annihilated with the breath of His mouth, allowing them to condemn Him falsely and to die on the cross. Difficult for us to imagine all that's involved in that experience, but that which we cannot fathom is that He suffered the wrath of God in our place. I wouldn't in any way suggest that being nailed to the cross and dying the death of crucifixions is not a horrible thing, but compared to being made sin for me, the death on the cross as a, as a, as a, a physical thing paled in comparison to Him being made sin for me. Did God suffer for me? Oh, dearly beloved, how can I put that into words? How can I begin to fathom how much He suffered that I might have life and have it more abundantly? You know, sin may be of little consequence to us, but to God it meant the death of His Son. It's not unreasonable that we who carry the Word, who minister the truth of Christ's Gospel, would be called to a life of suffering. You know that we're going to be left alone at Athens. Christian fellowship is a wonderful thing. We need, we need fellowship of brothers and sisters in Christ. If, if only we can find that on social media. We have that privilege today of having that fellowship, even though we may not have, have met in person. You know, a lonely life with no Christian fellowship is a difficult experience. It, it has to be, it must have been tough to be left alone at Athens. The center, not only of human culture, but of human defiance of God. The Lord Jesus Christ said to His disciples, I send you forth as sheep among wolves. He didn't say, I'll send you forth as sheep and wolves might come in. He said, I'm going to send you forth right where the wolves are. You know, and as far as any human shepherd's concerned, that's the height of foolishness. But we are God's testimony of suffering, even suffering to death. It was a testimony of Christ's gospel to be left alone at Athens. And so we sent precious fellowship, Timothy, our brother. We see brother throughout this epistle. We've seen it before and we'll see it again. God is not ashamed to call us his brother. And what a wonderful truth that that is. What a marvelous truth to know that He considers me to be His brother. If so, I'd expect to be a brother in suffering and difficulty. He's, he's going to leave Himself 
alone. And I'm saying, of course, well, that's Paul writing, but it's the Holy Spirit having Paul write this. What he wants us to see here, I believe, is how our fellowship and how our life is combined with Christ as brothers and sisters in Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith and trust in Christ. It's Christ's gospel. It's Christ's good news. That's a genitive in verse 2. This is Christ's good news. It's not the good news about Christ. It's Christ's good news to us. I have fabulous news for you. Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the gospel and He rose again from the dead according to the Scriptures. According to the Scriptures, folks. So we need to come to understand in that, in that declaration of the gospel that according to the Scriptures reveals to us very clearly and very plainly that we had no part, we played no part in our redemption whatsoever that God redeemed us freely, justified us freely by His grace, according to the Scriptures. So His death paid the price. It was sufficient. We are redeemed. And that's wonderful news. And the Holy Spirit calls other brothers in Christ to establish us concerning our faith and trust in Christ. Did you hear me? The Holy Spirit calls other brothers and sisters in Christ to establish us concerning our faith and trust in Christ. So simple. I mean, that, those so simple words to speak of trusting Him, believing in Him, and yet showing so little of that in the way that we live. How many times Christians have said to me, you know, Steve, you know, God's in control. God's in control, and then something that they consider to be serious happens. And it's all of a sudden now, now it's, uh, why, why, oh God, is this happening to me? When God is intensely interested in you and your faith and your trust in Him, what greater a thought could we have that we are called to trust God, the God, the one who does not lie. God doesn't change His mind. God's love is everlasting. If He loved you a year ago, He loves you the same today. He will always love you. No matter what happens in your life, His love will never change. He's working in you to will and to do of His good pleasure. So why should there ever be a why? Why should there ever be complaining? Don't be concerned about anything, but in everything we're told by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, give thanks unto God. We give thanks for the good things. Do we give thanks for the bad? You know, I, I hate even saying that word. Personally, I don't think we even have a right to call them bad. Not as Christians. They're there to comfort and strengthen us concerning our faith. That no man should be moved by these afflictions. We don't want any man to be disturbed by the afflictions which we suffer. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. Not only Paul, but you and me. I also am appointed to these sufferings. Not to the, to the degree that Paul and others were, but you and I are not called to a walk of ease. No, we're not promised by God that everything will just be great, you know, in as far as, you know, as we're concerned. We should, and we should enjoy life. We should enjoy life, but we should enjoy it in the confidence and the trust that we have in our Lord that He's working in us both the will and do of His good pleasure. I don't see how we could ask for anything better. To know Him is to know life eternal. And we are appointed to a life of suffering. The fact that He lives is the testimony that His death was sufficient. My sin debt's paid. The apostles were appointed to this suffering and we are, in the same sense, appointed to that suffering. But, but more than that, dearly beloved, the third verse has to be the Word of God. More than the Word of Paul. God is not only acquainted with our sufferings, but He's with us in that suffering. And what a wonderful truth that is. It doesn't matter what happens in your life. It doesn't matter what the suffering might be. He is with us. 
whatever suffering you endure, He also endured. And He is with us even to the end of the age. He has ordained Himself to be with us in our affliction. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass. And ye know, verse 4, you know. It's astounding as we go through this book how much doctrine and truth had been imparted to those at Thessalonica in three to four weeks. Almost inconceivable. How many times over the years I've had Bible teachers tell me, oh, I don't, I don't teach this or that or, or the other thing. I don't teach this or that truth. People aren't ready for it. And yet we see God speaking to these believers in the first few weeks of their redemption, their knowledge of their redemption, deep biblical doctrine. The doctrine concerning the deity and, and the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ, the triune God, the, the eschatological principles. It's amazing how, how that could all be covered in three to four weeks. But it was, you know this, that when we were with you, we told you before that we are going to suffer difficulties for you. It's been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. Think of that. Think of that. One of the things God has given you is the privilege to suffer for Him. Remember the disciples in the book of Acts. They counted it all joy when they were caused to suffer for Christ. Do we? Such a great amount of Christianity is complaining. I often think what the prayers that ascend to heaven must sound like. You know, give me this, give me that. Why God? Oh, why? Why this? What did I do wrong? Where is the worship? Where is the praise? Where is the thanksgiving that the Almighty, eternal God is with us to the end of the age that when He suffers, He suffers with us? Our faith is a gift from God and so is our suffering. How many times people have come to me trying to find out what, what in their life occasioned the suffering? You know, what sin, what mistake, what error in their ways has brought about this suffering? Which is one of the, actually that's one of the easiest questions to answer, there is, to answer. Nothing. Nothing. Kind of reminds me of the, the man who was born blind. Where they came and asked him, what did, what did, he, what did he do? Or what did his parents do that, that, that he would be born blind? You know, some will tell you, some will, some will suggest that that, that that may not be true sometimes. That, that sometimes the suffering and the difficulty that comes in your life is because we are led uh, and, and are ordained and given the privilege to suffer for Christ. That, you know, that all who will live godly lives in Christ Jesus shall suffer tribulation. But, but, the, but sometimes, sometimes you suffer because of your own stupidity or your own sin. And, and that, that, you know, God, God doesn't really have anything to do with that, though, that suffering, okay? He's kind of, he's gone on vacation, you know, in, in that part of your life. And folks, I don't agree with that. I'm going to suggest to you that, that I want to suggest that you never suffer for any reason except that God ordained it for a purpose because we serve a supremely sovereign God. Now, I'm not trying to take away anything from Paul here, but God is so, is so anxious, so concerned about your life and about my life. When he could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith. That behind the words that Paul has been led by God to pen is the truth of God's interest in me, in my life, and in yours. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. Verse 5. To know whether the tempter has tempted you and our labor, our, our activity in your life has been empty. 
Not that they are no longer redeemed, but that they are no longer trusting. I couldn't begin to suggest, possibly suggest, you know, what percentage of God's people don't really trust Him. If you asked me to suggest, I'd, I'd say up in the upper 90% range. Oh, I'm sure they trust Him to some degree, but, but simply to cast all your care on Him because He cares for you. That's what He told you to do. And I don't see that in very many lives. I try to make it true in mine. But I know that it, it, it not always is. How much has the tempter tempted me so that all that God has put forth in my life is empty? Think of it. it empty, not in the sense that, it's, that it, His work is not effectual in my life, that, that He didn't apply that, that work of Christ in my life. No, that's not what I mean by empty. Empty in the sense, from my perspective, in the sense that I'm not taking advantage of what He's done in my life. Think of it, folks. God Almighty died for me to secure my redemption, and I doubt Him. I don't trust Him. I question Him. I complain. I grumble. We have the testimony of the children of Israel. It's difficult to imagine the deliverance that, that they had from the land of Egypt to cross the sea on dry land. You know, if folks, if you and I divided the waters, it'd be, it'd be a week before the land dried out enough to walk on. But they did it overnight. The whole miracle is astounding. Hard to believe you and I would, would so easily have forgotten that, but they did, and, and so would many of us. We'd have forgotten it as well. You know, in just a few days, they didn't like the manna. They wanted to go back to Egypt. They complained against God's leaders, God's direction, God's everything. And we go through their wilderness experience just to find that, that they murmured and they complained more than they did anything else. How about us as the body of Christ? How much do we absolutely trust Him? If He brings the cloud, fine, He'll bring the rainbow. He's the God who works in us to will and to do of His good pleasure. Not a single thing touches your life or mine that isn't for our good. Seems to me one of the privileges that, that God has given us is to simply trust Him. I believe it's, it's what I've expressed this on numerous occasions. I believe that is what Christ desires the most from us. He's my God. He's my Father. He does not consider me to be a slave or a servant or a prisoner, but a son, a brother. He's not ashamed to call me brother because He bore my sin and my iniquity, and I stand before Him without spot and without blemish. By the blood of the cross, you are presented holy and unblameable, not by the way you live, not by by what you believe, not by what you did, not by anything in you, including trusting in Him, but by the death of Christ, you are presented faultless before the presence of God. And He asks us to trust Him. What a marvelous truth. So we ought to trust Him, trust that His labor is not in vain. But now when Timothy came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. Verse 6. Now that's true of Paul. I have no doubt that Paul wrote that. But God also sees your faith and trust in Him. And when He sees it, and it's really there, He rejoices. Think of it. God is comforted and rejoices in the fact that you trusted Him. Not that you did something, but simply to see your faith. Verse 7, Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. Paul is comforted to be sure, but God also is comforted. I believe absolutely that is what our text says. What did it cost God for your faith? There is no way that you could trust in God had He not become your Redeemer. 
That's what you trust in. You trust in the good news of Jesus Christ, that He died in your place, that He gave Himself for you, that your sins are forgiven, that your sin debt is paid, that He did that, that you had no part in that. If you think you did, you don't understand this book. The gospel is that we are redeemed only because Christ died in our place. We were not redeemed because of anything we did. To believe otherwise is to not know true joy, true peace, true faith, love, hope, comfort, obedience, righteousness, suffering. All that you think, feel, and do will be an artificial, sub-spiritual, humanistic, natural, not spiritual, self-deceptive, pseudo-imitation of an unreal copy of what is genuine, what is real, what, what God planted in your life. It'll, it's, it's something else. It's something other. It's, it's, it was planted in your life by our enemy Satan and his messengers. It will not be that which our Heavenly Father gave us, which Christ gives and the Holy Spirit teaches. It will not be the life that Christ lives in and through you, no matter how religious that you think you are. No, no matter how much Scripture you've memorized, no matter how popular you are, no matter how many good works you do, or, or how much you have sacrificed, quote-unquote, or, or given in the service of the Lord. And if what I've told you is not 100% truth, then God, folks, God lied, okay? In the verses that we've been studying together for years now. In Romans, Ephesians, Colossians, Titus, Jude, parts of John. You know, the series on freedom and in numerous other teaching videos on the grace of God that redeemed us freely without a cause. That you stand before God faultless. Why? Because He suffered and God is comforted that that suffering was not in vain. And of course it isn't because God works in us both the will and the do of His good pleasure. We've come to a wonderful verse, verse 8. Not, not to... Not to not to say that any, any other of these verses are not just as wonderful, but what a wonderful verse, verse 8 is. I'm not going to be able to finish this video uh, on, on that verse and fully explaining that verse. For now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. The very rejoicing the product, the consummation of the death of Jesus Christ for our sin and His resurrection from the dead is the standing fast in, in, in Jesus Christ. Our lives are hid in Christ. We're new creations because He died in our place. We stand before Him faultless and uncondemned. That is a wonderful truth. Oh, dearly beloved, think of it. Because He died for us, we have redemption. And God Almighty rejoices in the fact that His sacrifice, His suffering for us was not in vain. No matter how much we complain, no matter how much we murmur, because we trust Him to some degree, because it is apparent that we are His children, His work is not in vain. His work through the Apostle Paul was not in vain. God didn't have to use Paul to complete His Word. He, you know, he could have written it in the stars. He doesn't need ministers to proclaim the truth of His Word. He could have had the angels do it, but He didn't. He chose men to complete His Word. He chooses men to give forth His Word. And, and He does rejoice that the activity of those whom He has called to declare Christ's good news is not in vain. God doesn't make mistakes. God doesn't make decisions. God doesn't throw possibilities up in the air, you know, and, 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 and choose one. What God does is right. It's always right. What God always does is right. And it was His good pleasure to choose men, not only to complete His Word, but to declare its truth. And He rejoices that the means by which He ordained to, to proclaim that truth works. 
Look, I love you all. I truly do. I want to thank you all for your continued interest in this channel, in this ministry, for all of your encouraging comments on social media and on YouTube, for all of your love, your prayers, and your support. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.